Hello, this is Roof of the Clan of the Grey Wolf, and welcome again to 8-Bit Gems. You know, it's hard to believe that it's already April 1st, and I still haven't talked about this game yet. It's truly one of the most unheralded classics of yesteryear, and really well ahead of its time. Today's episode is all about North and South for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Though the Super Nintendo was no stranger to strategy games, North and South was one of the few from that genre available on the American NES. A strategy slash action game based on the American Civil War, you'd think this would be one of those games, like Liberty or Death, that appealed only to a limited North American audience. However, this title has an interesting background that secured a worldwide release and found some fans across the globe. One reason for that is because it was developed by the French company Infogram Entertainment in 1989. That was before it bought up half of the game development houses under the sun, incurred as much debt as a small Eastern European country, and changed its name to Atari, a brand that it assimilated in 2001. Though a prolific publisher, Infogram probably hasn't developed anything that many gamers have heard of other than the Alone in the Dark series. Another international quirk of this game, with ostensibly American subject matter, is the fact that it's based off of a Belgian comic series. Well. Okay, the Civil War wasn't based off of a Belgian comic. Your history teacher didn't lie that blatantly to you. But the character designs are based off of the popular series La Tunique Bleu, literally the Blue Tunics. Belgian comics are a popular subgenre of Franco-Belgian comics that include well-known franchises such as The Adventures of Tintin or The Smurfs. And La Tunique Bleu is an especially popular series in Europe that's run continuously since 1970 through the present day. The story follows the adventures of a couple of northern soldiers and their interactions with historical figures and famous battles throughout the Civil War. Usually presented with an amusing tone that's punctuated at times with the senselessness of war, the series has stood the test of time. But the story itself doesn't really matter too much here since it's pretty much just the style of the comic that's borrowed by the game. So, starting out, you'll notice that North and South provides quite a few options. You can choose to play as the Union or the Confederacy, obviously. But you'll also notice that you can play the two sides as human against computer, both with human players or both with computer players. You know, if you're the kind of person who would enjoy a game of Jeopardy with three Watsons. But beyond that, you can toggle various events, goose the cameraman, and set the difficulty level of each player. Yes, even yours. More on that later. Another interesting way to modify the game is to select in which year of the Civil War you'd like to begin your campaign. 1861, 62, 63, or 64. Each one roughly approximates the strength of the combatants during that year, and brings with it something of a difficulty setting in its own right. 62 found the Confederacy in a strategically superior position, 64 the Union. 61 and 63 found each side about equal, but at different stages of preparedness. Once you begin the game, you're introduced to the map screen. This is, pretty obviously, where you'll make your overarching troop movements. And unlike a lot of otherwise great PC games ported to consoles that suffered from clunky controls, North and South avoids this pitfall so well that I never even realized its mouse and keyboard origins when I played this as a kid on the Nintendo. In fact, I'd go as far to say that the console version has the superior controls. The action portions, especially platforming, are very natural for the gamepad, and the map screen doesn't require a wide scope of clickable items with the mouse pointer, just a small number of troop movements. So here's the rundown of the map. The US of the 1860s is roughly sketched out for you, with states and some territories each acting as their own regions, which can be under your control and or hold an army. There are also five dots in five states across the map. Each of these represents a fort. When you have at least two connected right next to each other, you'll have a train run money between them at the beginning of your turn, the amount of which depends on how many states you control. Five bags of money delivered to your vault means another army unit available for deployment. The map screen is also where those optional events from the opening menu come into play. There's a storm cloud that inhibits troop movement from its state, occasional reinforcements brought in for whoever controls North Carolina, and random total army deaths in the western border states due to... Uh, well, eh, it's a French game. It's okay if they're racist. As many World War I generals realized, starting a battle is as simple as throwing your troops at the enemy. Once that's done on the main map, the battle screen is where the most important action of the game occurs. Each army starts with three different types of units that have their own utility. 
One cannon, which can take a few seconds to charge up and blow up several guys at once if they're stupid enough to not get out of the way. Three cavalrymen, who can charge speedily and cut down enemies with their short-range swords. And six riflemen, who plod around wherever they want on the map, dispensing mini-ball justice with great prejudice. There are some subtleties to keep in mind, however. For instance, the cannon can move up and down to aim, but not forward. And after nine shots, the cannon will automatically retreat. Cavalry can only move forward, but at least can be held to a stop if you push back on the D-pad. After making a charge, any surviving members will make their way to the nearest Stargate and appear again at your rear flank, ready for another charge. The riflemen move very slowly, but can go anywhere in a 2x3 or 3x2 formation. In some ways, these guys can be the most fun, since they give you the opportunity to get tricky with a computer opponent by implementing some hit-and-run tactics. Finally, you can reenact the fun of early guerrilla warfare at home on your NES. Of course, control over your troops is limited by the simple gamepad, and you can only direct one unit at a time. At difficulty level 3, the computer cheats off of its ass and throws everything at you all at once, so you gotta be sneaky with those tactics, and take into consideration your battlefield. You see, depending on where the battle takes place, you could be fighting over an open field or across some sort of natural barrier that will swallow careless troops whole. And though there's always at least one narrow, indestructible path to the enemy side, there's also another that's not so sturdy against the errant cannonball or two. One of the most satisfying moments in the game is taking out a bridge that the enemy cavalry really planned on being there three seconds ago. Another wrinkle is that you combine armies up to three times their normal strength just by joining them in the same state on the map screen. It's a great way to overpower the enemy, but at the same time, it can be difficult to keep track of everything going on at once. You probably shouldn't get too attached to your three cannon column of death. Regardless, the battle ends when one side is completely obliterated or retreats. You'll come across the third type of stage whenever you or the enemy try to invade one of the five states with a fort. The action moves to a side-scrolling platformer, with the attacker, symbolized by a rather angry-looking boot, racing time, quite literally, on his way to capture the fort's flag. You see, it's a little-known fact that armies in the Civil War played by the grade school rules of warfare. As the attacker, you get four throwing knives, and after that your fists, to use against ten defenders, who will appear one at a time in single file to hide their numbers. They're fairly easy to defeat and can either die in one hit or fall off the edge of the screen. When you get hit, you'll fall down, but can just get back up after a few seconds, meaning that the only thing you really lose in that situation is precious time. As the defender, you can deploy your men one at a time at your leisure, but with limitations to offset their numbers. For example, in addition to the easy dying thing, they can't climb ladders, meaning they're quickly left behind. All in all, though it takes a few tries to get used to, it's a well-balanced system and a pretty clever implementation of the one versus many mechanic. However, the chosen difficulty level really comes into play here, as fort incursions are much harder to pull off against higher levels. Essentially, the higher a player, or computer's, level is set, the faster their little icon at the bottom moves. So, if your attacker is level 1, then the defender is level 3, you'll be trucking for quite a while to make your boot move while the clock just seems to chug along merrily. These platforming stages also come into play when an army occupies a state in the way of an opposing force's money train. That allows the army to send an infiltrator to try and hold up the train and steal its money. The mechanics are very similar to the fort stage, except that if you spend too much time on the ground, where the attacker begins, the train will pass you by mighty quick. Overall, the difficulty is pretty easy after you become a veteran, yuck yuck yuck, of the game. Personally, I find the most fun challenge to be a level 1 fighting against a level 3 computer in 1863, regardless of the chosen side. There are enough units in play in that situation to ensure that the game lasts longer than 10 minutes, but that just scratches the surface. The real fun begins when you rope your friend into the two-player game, which is an experience that is still a lot of fun over 20 years later. For my money, this is one of the best two-player experiences on the NES. The graphics are quite good for the Nintendo, but that's not surprising considering the game came out in the console's later days. The Franco-Belgian influence is apparent and makes for a great aesthetic choice, especially if you're at all a fan of the style. The comic-like graphics and animations are an interesting juxtaposition to the otherwise heavy subject matter of an actual war, but it works. The humorous moments are welcome distractions and don't clash, creating a unique experience. This is a balance that's kept Le Tunique Bleu popular for decades. 
And the music is also really damn impressive. There are several tunes taken from classic American patriotic and folk music that are faithfully represented, including The Star Spangled Banner, Turkey in the Straw, Yankee Doodle, and of course, Dixie. This is in addition to a few original tunes that add well to the atmosphere, including the tense introduction theme and the happy tune that plays at the end of the game, signaling the hope of an oncoming peace. Furthermore, the sound effects, from rifle shots to cavalry trumpet calls, are clear, distinct, and not grating at all, which you'll appreciate even more if you've ever played this game on the PC. So, if you're looking for some interactive strategic entertainment that reduces the bloodiest conflict in American history to some hilariously animated cartoons, then this game might be for you. Uh, check by eBay and you should be able to find it for 10 bucks or less. You will not be disappointed. This has been Roof of the Clan of the Grey Wolf and the reset button's right here. See? Si tu sais penser à l'autre, si l'autre...